Good morning. We will now be presenting our solution to this year's M3 challenge problem, substance use and abuse. The problem we are tasked with addressing is threefold. First, we constructed a math model to predict the spread of nicotine use due to vaping over the next decade and to compare this trend to that of cigarettes. In part two, we simulated the probability that a given individual would use nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, and unprescribed opioids, and we applied our model to 300 high school seniors. Finally, in part three, we developed a metric to quantify the impact of substance abuse, and we used it to rank the same four substances. So beginning with part one, we first showed to predict the spread of nicotine use due to vaping and cigarettes separately over the next decade. To do this, we modified the SIR epidemic model, which is an established technique used to model infectious diseases like influenza. SIR divides a population into three namesake compartments. Susceptible, for those who do not have a disease but are vulnerable to it, infected for those currently afflicted and recovered for individuals with acquired immunity. People who are naturally immune to a disease are kept separate. We applied this epidemic model to our topic because nicotine use demonstrates key features of an infectious disease. In 2018, the US Surgeon General declared youth vaping to be a nationwide epidemic, which reflects the prevalent and contagious nature of nicotine addiction. Also, a basic requirement for SIR modeling is that infection occurs via contact with the already infected. Similarly, vaping and smoking habits reach new people through exposure to current users, not necessarily physical, such as through peer pressure, advertisements, and social media. With these parallels established, we applied the SIR compartments to nicotine use. Susceptible refers to non-smokers who are open to smoking. Infected represents regular smokers. And recovered includes past smokers who have quit, at least temporarily. People who will never smoke are counted as not susceptible and are omitted from the cycle. So this flowchart here, uh, diagrams the relationship between the compartments of the population in our model. People progress from susceptible to infected to recover, but our model differs from normal SIR because when an, when an individual relapses after a quit attempt, he or she will return to the infected category and become a smoker once again. So we renamed our model SIRI to represent this adjustment. Next, Jason will further discuss model implementation. In our model, birth occurs when people turn 11 years old, since this is the peak age at which people first start to try nicotine products. By birth, children have already been exposed to drug abuse through social media and peer pressure, so everyone is put into the susceptible category. Therefore, the birth rate is the natality rate 11 years ago. The natality rate has remained relatively stable, so the birth rate is assumed to be constant. 0.00103 new people enter the system each month per person already in the system. People leave the series system when they die because people can smoke until death. The death rate constant nu is assumed to be constant over time and equal for everyone at 0.0007. Therefore, there is an outflow of people from susceptible, infected, and recovered directly out of the system, directly proportional to the size of each group. Now I'll cover the motion of people inside of the series system. The infection rate is the movement of people from susceptible to infected. The infection rate is directly proportional to the size of the susceptible and infected groups because infection can only occur between a susceptible and infected person. The infection rate constant gamma beta was uh, determined to be e uh, 0.18 for e-cigarettes and 0.003 for cigarettes. Uh, the infection rate constant is a chance that an infected person will turn susceptible, uh, susceptible person will turn infected when coming in contact with an infected person. The recovery rate is the movement of people from infected into recovered and is solely dependent on the number of infected people. The recovery rate gamma was determined to be 0.0284 for uh, um, yeah, because <laughs> the which was determined through historical uh, historical uh, results on uh, previous smokers' attempts to quit smoking. Uh, the relapse rate is the movement of people from recovered back into infected, and is solely dependent on the size of the recovered category. The relapse rate constant psi was determined to be 0.0568 for both e-cigarettes and cigarettes, because uh, the addictive agent in both is nicotine. This set of differential equations shows the rates of change of each of the three major groups over time. The rate of change of a group is equal to the rate of inflow minus the rate of outflow. For example, the rate of change of susceptible is equal to the birth rate minus the infection rate minus the death rate. A Python program numerically integrated this set of differential equations using today's conditions as initial values. As expected, e-cigarette use is, uh, is projected to rise uh, as shown on, in red on the left, and cigarette use is expected to drop, as shown in uh, red on the right. By 2029, our model projects that 26.63% of the population will be using e-cigarettes, and 6.45% of the population will be using cigarettes. We conducted a sensitivity analysis on the infection, recovery, and relapse constants, 
and a 10% change in the constant resulted in a less than 5% change in nicotine use in the appropriate direction, suggesting our model's resilience. Our theory model incorporates a variety of factors, making it a robust model for nicotine use in the next decade. Next, Gustav will talk about part two. In part two, we were tasked with determining whether a student will use a certain substance based on their attributes and applying that to a group of 300 high school seniors to determine how many will use nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, and opiates. To determine whether a student will use a certain substance based on their individual attributes, we developed a logistic ridge regression model. We proposed that a survey be conducted in order to generate new data uh, to train this model. We used the 2005-2006 Health Behavior and School Age Children Survey to test our model as a proof of concept. This survey asked students 80 questions related to risk behaviors and possibly correlated factors. First, we chose 11 independent variables profiling students in four general categories. First, basic demographics, such as gender, age, and income. Then, child to guardian relations, such as which parents are home. Then, student to student relations, such as bullying and time spent with friends. Finally, we included personal feelings, such as feelings about health and school. Then, we chose four dependent variables which asked students about their use of alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, and unprescribed opioids in the past 12 months. First, the data had to be pre-processed to reduce accidental bias and improve accuracy. For example, missing independent variables were flagged and interpolated with existing values. This is necessary due to the small size of the data set and justified due to the use of L2 regularization, which uh, decreases the weights and uh, spreads out the uh, weights of the independent variables. Then, data was also randomly sorted and split into two-thirds for training and one-third for model verification to prevent overfitting. We use this logistic equation because it is easy to fit to binary data and can provide confidence scores for individuals. In normal uh, logistic regression, the loss function is defined as the sum of the squared error, where y is the actual value and each sub data is the uh, prediction function. However, we use L2 regularization, which introduces a second term, namely the sum of the square of the weights multiplied by a constant lambda. This has the effects of bringing the weights close to zero, but never reaching zero. Uh, spreading the weights more evenly and reducing dependence on any single independent variable. We trained this model for uh, each of the four dependent variables and achieved 73% accuracy or higher for each of the four substances. Opioids had a 98% uh, 98 accuracy due to only 3% of students in the model in, in the data set having used opiates. We then ran a Monte Carlo simulation using a distribution specified in the data set to randomly generate values for a group of 300 high school seniors. We, achieved, we obtained the following percentages for use of alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, and unprescribed opioids. We then compared this to a 2006 external study called Monitoring the Future uh, to determine how closely our values correlated with values obtained at the time. We achieved less than 10% error in alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana and achieved 100% error in opiates due to us predicting 0% of students having used opiates, while the survey uh, reported 0.8% of students using opiates. Overall, our model, uh, our model shows high accuracy and is consistent with data obtained at the time. Next, Eric will talk about part three. In part three, we were tasked with developing a model to determine the impact of substance abuse by taking into account both financial and non-financial factors. We then applied the model to rank the four substances from the previous part, which were nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, and unprescribed opioids. We determined that it would be important to assess the impact of substance abuse on both the individual and societal level, because certain drugs like heroin might be a lot more dangerous at the individual level, while other drugs like alcohol might still be more dangerous at the societal level due to having a lot more users. We then determined that the impact of substance abuse can be split up into four factors. Physical harm, dependence, social harm, and economic impact. Physical harm is further split up into three subfactors: acute, chronic, and intravenous physical harm. Acute physical harm refers to the immediate effects of drug use, while chronic physical harm refers to the effects of repeated drug use. Intravenous physical harm refers to the effects of injecting via needles, if applicable. Dependence was split up into pleasure, psychological damage, and physical dependence. Pleasure refers to the high or rush associated with drug use, while psychological damage and physical dependence refers to the psychological and physical withdrawal symptoms, respectively. Then, social harm is split up into, into intoxication and other harm. 
Intoxication refers to damages that are done while under the influence, while other harm refers to other things that are commonly associated with drug use, such as crime and domestic violence. Finally, economic impact is split up into healthcare costs and GDP effect. Healthcare costs is defined as the costs associated with treating damages done to the human body as a result of drug use. Healthcare costs and all previous sub-factors mentioned before it was scaled from 0 to 3 based on a survey of extra psychiatrists on the effects of drug use. GDP effect was defined as the average GDP a person, a person generates in the United States per year times the average decrease in lifespan due to the use of the drug. These values were also scaled from 0 to 3 as shown in the table. Then each factor score equals the average of the sub-factor scores and, and individual impact equals the average of the four factor scores. In order to, to, in order to determine societal impact from individual impact, risk scales were determined for the four substances by linearly scaling, the, linearly scaling the number of users for the four drugs from 0 to 1. Finally, societal impact equals risk scaler times individual impact. Now, Kyle will discuss the results of part three. The table shown displays the sub-factor scores and major factor averages for each of the four substances analyzed. According to our model, opioids rank most harmful for the individual, while marijuana ranked least harmful. This makes sense because opioids tend to have fatal effects to the user, while marijuana has medical benefits. The new table shown summarizes the societal impact of each of the four drugs. To obtain the societal impact score, the harm score was multiplied by the risk scaler. According to our model, alcohol ranked most harmful, while opioids ranked least harmful. This makes sense because there are a significantly greater number of alcohol users when compared to opioids. A sensitivity analysis was performed on our part three model. As physical average changed by a certain percentage, the output changed proportionally. One of the major strengths of our model is that it can be applied to a variety of drugs. Additionally, because it takes into account physical harm, social harm, economic harm, and dependence, is able to account for a variety of effects of these drugs. To summarize, we use real-world data to model drug spread and impact. In part one, we model drug spread like an epidemic to predict an increase in e-cigarette use and a decrease in cigarette use by 2029. In part two, we use a logistic regression in combination with a Monte Carlo simulation to predict drug use within the high school senior population. Our model was able to predict drug use with over 70% accuracy and within 10% error of generally accepted statistics of the time period. In our part three model, we analyzed the effects of drugs on both the individual and society. For individuals, opioids rank most harmful while marijuana ranked least harmful. For society, alcohol ranked most harmful while opioids ranked least harmful. As drug use increases, it becomes ever necessary to understand its spread and effects. All in all, we believe our models provide novel insight on the nationwide issue of drug use and abuse. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, thank you. Congratulations again for being here. So I had a question for you about your um, answer to question three. And I don't know if you want to pull up the table, the table with your harm values in it. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further on how you obtained those values, maybe the one right. Can you, can you just give a little bit more background where those came from? So all the sub-factors other than the GDP effect were taken from a survey of psychiatrists on the effects of drug use. So those values were scaled from zero to three and they, they used the same sub-factors as us. And so we took that data and then we felt that it was necessary to um, include GDP effect into economic impact because their, um, their data was more focused on the non-financial aspects of drug use. So we felt it was important to include the financial aspects as well. So that's why we chose to include GDP effect, which was calculated with the equation on the previous slide. I'd like, I'd like to, to ask a question about your Monte Carlo simulation. You had percentages of people in different groups and uh, the table in terms of harms. Uh, why do a Monte Carlo simulation rather than try to calculate a uh, theoretical value for your percentages? Um, so uh, the advantage of the Monte Carlo is that um, we can use the uh, we can use the model that we already uh, used previously, and then um, by randomly simulating values, then we can generate uh, we can basically generate individuals and put them through the model. So it provides more of a um, 
real-world application of the model uh, with their attributes, and then we take all of the results of whether they're uh, whether they use nicotine, marijuana, etc., and then uh, uh, use the um, values from there. So there is a slight deviation because we're generating random values, but it still obtains um, real-world applicable da uh, data. Um, I just had a question about your rates in your SIRI model. Uh, which rates? So I know that you explained um, maybe the um, the death rate, but can you explain how you got? how you calculated beta and alpha, how you made those choices for beta and alpha? Um, we got beta through uh, a survey, uh, the Surgeon General Report survey, uh, asked, which asked participants whether they would smoke if a friend did so. So um, um, that, that was beta. Um, that's an infection rate constant. And uh, alpha was the birth rate, which was the uh, because we assumed that uh, everyone enters the, uh, enters the Siri population at year 11, the birth rate was the natality rate 11 years ago, because we also made the assumption that no children die between um, uh, their actual birth and 11 years of age. So uh, alpha was the nat uh, natality rate 11 years ago, and beta it, uh, was taken from uh, the Surgeon General report. We, oh, we also took the natality rate and divided it by 1,000, because the uh, natality rate or birth rate is commonly calculated per 1,000 people. So because we're doing it in terms of one per as a proportion, right? So we just divided it by a thousand, which is why the value is so small. Uh, another question about this particular model. You say that the proportion of people, uh, the people moving from recovered to infected is proportional to the number of recovered, but the number of people moving from susceptible to infected depends on the product. Why not use a product between infected and recovered in terms of transmission? Uh, we felt that uh, relapse would um, be solely dependent on the user. Um, people would be compelled to uh, compelled to come back into smoking uh, because of uh, nicotine's addictive effects. <laughs> However, in order to start smoking, uh, you would have to be uh, influenced by someone already smoking or learn from it from uh, like advertisements or television commercials or something of the sort. So um, we felt that uh, it should not. Uh, the relapse rate should not be directly proportional to the infected the size of the infected group because of this. Okay, I'm going to push you a little bit on your question three. So it looks like you sort of have two different answers. If I'm reading this right, you have a metric for whether a drug is bad for an individual, and you have a metric for whether a drug is bad for society. Um, and so, if I were going to come up with a metric just for quote how bad the drug is. Is there some way that you can, is there, a, is there any way that you would come up with a single metric? How would you combine those? Would you combine them? Is there one that you would prefer better than the other? Uh, so, like, we chose to present those two numbers because we thought that it would be really important to show how on an individual level, drugs like opioids are a lot more dangerous than something like alcohol. But since in the society, there's just so many more uses of alcohol, we felt it would be it would be a it would be an incorrect uh, representation of the danger of the drug just to say opioids are still the most dangerous, and we felt the same way like vice versa. So I guess if we had to present just one number, I would go with the society as a whole because um, I think it is more beneficial to talk about it on like a macro scale. But I think I still think it's important to present both numbers because like you can't just discount how dangerous opioids are just because there's so little uses of them. But the same way you can't discount alcohol because just for one user it might be less dangerous, but for the society as a whole, it has a lot more harm. Thank you. Um, excellent job. So uh, we'll conclude the questions portion. You guys can exit through that door. Thank you.